we'll turn it over to you, Laura. Okay. I appreciate y'all letting me speak tonight. Appreciate you zooming in. So I'm going to talk about Roa mites. And um, can everybody see my screen? Um, I can. Yes. Okay. And um, if you have any questions, just ask them and we'll answer them. And the reason why I'm talking about Varroa mites is the research has changed on it. New data has come up. I'm sure some of you have heard it. Some may not have. So we're going to go over it. And there's quite a few things that I learned in writing this presentation that I'm going to bring out. Um, we're talking about the Varroa destructor. It's obligated long. It's an external parasite on the honeybee. And it's now thought to really be the Varroa jacosin. And it's what it is now. Um, research showed 92% of 2,901 samples over five years have this disease in its pest. So 92% of honeybees that they research have Varroa mites. Um, originally, they were found in Asia and they were thought to host to the Apis serrana and it's in South East Asia, and they develop a resistance to the mite. Um, Roar only in these bees reproduces on the drone brews. So these large honeybees, they go through and they entomb the drones that brew, and then the bees groom the mites off their body. So this is where they originally were found, and they have developed a mechanism in order to live with it. And if you look here at this map, early 1900s, it shows Asia. My corner shows up, shows Asia with 1900s and then 1910, how it spread down in the countries around this world, entered our country about 1984 is what I was reading in one research article. And that is about when I believe, I lived in Mississippi and we had bees that were dying and we didn't know why. So I believe they were here in about 84 to 88. In 88, it was really, they were getting rough and we didn't know what the problem was. And that's why I, we didn't have a bee club down where I lived and that's why I believe in blowing to a bee club because I knew about small high beetle before it ever got into Kentucky through going to the bee club. And some of the, like the African ice bees, I knew about how they, when they entered the state of Kentucky and about what they thought would take care of it and how it wouldn't become a bad pest for us. And that's what happened. And that's been 20 something years ago, they were discussing it. Um, this is where the Varroa destructor is found now. It's all over the world about it, except there's not none in um, Greenland, right there. They're not finding it. And they seem to think there's one spot in Canada that doesn't have it. Down here in these African countries, there's several spots in here that don't have them or they haven't been found yet. But we are definitely in the red. We're in the red zone, if we say, with COVID, with the Varroa destructor. So if you don't have a problem with it, you are or you will at some point here pretty quick. Um, how are they spread? They're spread by horizontal transmission. A hive, a strong, real strong hive will go rob a weaker hive, carry them back. Bees come in, sometimes they drift from one hive to another. Um, drones will go into the wrong hive by drifting. Um, if you buy or if you sell bees, you could be selling the varroa mite with the honeybees. If you move honeybees from one area to another, so we got all these honeybees coming up I-75 and through 80, you're going to have the mite in those hives moving. And they have found, they jump from bee to bee. And they have found research where this mite, well, they found it'll be on a flyer, like in this video, and it will jump to that bee there. So it has a host. So it fell off of one bee and jumped to another. And then that bee there, carry it back to the hive and introduce it into the hive. So it is horizontal transmission. You can, you can see it with the human eye. They said if they were the size of our body compared to a honey bee, if they were on our body, they would be the size of a dinner plate if they were on us. And that's how big they are on a honey bee. They're eyeless so that bees, can, the rural mites cannot see. The adult females are reddish brown and they're oblong. They're large compared to the size of a honeybee. The cortex, and they, because their cortex around, they can fit to the honeybee, the adult bee. 
So that makes them where they can fly with, you know, the bees, the body of the bees. They have found them in swarms. I've seen them on bees when I picked up a swarm. And they mimic the smell of the honeybee. So the honeybee doesn't really realize, other than the, it being there, realize what's going on. Um, here's a picture of it on this bee. See how it's cortex? It's round. It fits to the shape of the bee. And this is a picture here, a diagram of it being of a beat of the process, but I'm going to go into it in different detail here in just a second. But that's <coughs> queen bee laying the egg. This is the larva. Uh, let's see if I memorize this. This is the larva. This is the larva re releasing a smell saying, come cat me. The pheromone smells that. I mean, the, the mite smells that pheromone. It crawls down into that cell with that larva that's now stretching out to become a pupa. It will hide. I have read research paper where they're saying it hides underneath right in here and it will stay there till it gets capped. And then once it's capped, it will come out and then she'll start laying eggs. The reddish ones are always female. My light went out. Um, here it is again. Here it is on this grown brood. You say to me, how do I know it's grown brood? because the eyes are huge and drone brood takes a little bit longer in order to develop. Let's see if I can pull y'all back up again. So for that reason, the varroa mite is smart and it realizes it takes longer to develop, so it likes drone brood. Uh, the development stages of it is right here. Um, this is the female. See how she looks, it's 36 hours. 21, 17. Anyway, this is the female. The male will stay white. He'll never get red. So when that drone comes out or when that bee comes out, it'll die because it does not have that hardened shell as the female does. The drone legs are longer. You can see them there. And that is the development stages. Now, fat bodies is what Dr. Samuel Ramsey has found. He done quite a bit of research on these mites. And this is where he found that the mite is eating. It's underneath the bee's plate right here, where that red dot is, that's where you'll find it most of the time. See this purple dots and these purple dots where we're seeing them? That's when they've gotten real bad infestation and it's just crawling around, riding around on that bee. That's how often you see it there very rarely. Mostly you're going to see it here where it's chewing on the fat body of the bee, which is similar to the liver. See it here in this photo here, underneath that plate that the bee has to make it aerodynamic. And it is chewing on the something similar to our liver. Where'd it go to? So here it is, it's a cross section. And see these mouth parts where they go down here and it attaches to the bee and then it inserts and it gets down into the bee fat body. It's not sucking the hemoglobin, which is what I had read and was told. And what I think everybody thought to Dr. Ramsey had re released this research. And that seems like all specialists are in agreement that the mind is chewing on the fat bodies or eating, living off of that. So that, that's a different knowledge and that's knowledge that we need to know in order to be able to combat these things. Here is the um, life cycle. The female enters the cell, crawls down underneath the larva there. And like I said, a pheromone is being released to say, come cat me. And she lives there. And then she'll come out and lay eggs once the capping takes place. And first 70 hours, she'll lay a male. And then every 30 hours after that capping was put on, she'll lay a female. And then the male will hatch. And she has made a port into this bee belly. And that's what they're feeding off of on this, as this reproductive process and this growth goes on. And at the same time, they're exposing this bee to several different pathogens, um, such as viruses and stuff that's going on right here. And when she defecates, she will defecate underneath this capping. They don't defecate down in here, they defecate underneath this capping. So if you've got a dead hive and you go out there and look at it, look around the edges at the top to see if you see little white marks. See my next. And then when the bee hatches and it comes out, the female will go with that bee and 
and date another one. And the reason why um, I'd always refer from the male and the male will breed with the females that hatch. So I thought they're interbreeding, which is that may be happening. And I thought they're still pretty smart for interbreeding. However, just because one mite went down in here does not mean that several different mites didn't go down in here. So their genetics is being diverse because there's more than one female possibly in here laying. So a brother may not breed a sister. It may be a brother and some, I mean, a, a male and another female from another female. Because the first one's going to be a male and then the next one will be females till this bee hatches. And say three or four material comes out with three or four times, say, 100 grams, that'll be three or 400 mites. So over time, you're talking about a serious problem going on here. Um, here it is sitting here on these drones. Now, drones take 24 days. Uh, worker bees take 21 days. And you can pull the captains off and you can pull out your drones and look for mites. And that's one way of looking for signs of mites. However, I was in Hive in Louisville and me and that beekeeper, we went through there and we pulled out some drone frames and we were just a checking them. We didn't find no mites. So we went down this mite test and we'll tell you about here in a minute. And he had a bad infestation. Come fall, he would have been, or midsummer, he would have been in problems and he would have never know what happened. But he actually did have drone, uh, mice down in them hives. They were on the female, on the adult worker bee. And they weren't a bad infestation in the drone, in the brood yet. Could be they went and robbed a hive and they had just brought the mice back. I don't know. So what had happened? But I do know this is not always real ac accurate, but is a good indicator that you can go by this too. Just we'll get into other ways you can check. The mother mite reproduction, she can hold up 35 sperm. She lays five to six eggs per reproductive cycle. Five to six eggs. Eggs, I'm sorry. One and one and a half to three reproductive cycles in her life um, up to in her lifetime in the hive, but they have gotten seven cycles in the lab. And she produces one or two adult female per cycle on a worker pupil, two to three on a drone. So we're talking about two to three on drones. So this is serious. In the lab, I mean that female can lay males and mate with their own sons if they're not mated. Um, and that's in the lab. They don't know if this actually happens out in the hive. And the space that they go through could be one up to 10 days. This is seasonal mite growth because this is going on during the, when the egg laying and stuff is going on in the hive. It'll be down low in April. We're coming up on our spring honey flow into April, May, March, April, and May. It's going to go up because the amount of brew and that hive is going up. Wait, I'm sorry. This here is the mite load. It's down low, but at, what I'm trying to say is as she's laying more, it's going to pick up. Now, and they coming up on September and October, like we just came through, the bee is laying less. She's cutting down. Our days are getting shorter over here. She's, our days are getting longer, so she's pushing more and more bees. This is our, I'm sorry. Um, this right here is our bee number. See how they are? This is the bees from fall. They'll go down in March and April, and then they'll go back up with the spring and summer bees. Our fall bees are born in the fall. Their fatty metabolism is different, and they will live to spring. The spring bee lives, I think, an average about three to six weeks at the most. She does not live as long, maybe six weeks, as the fall bee. Her metabolism is totally different. But see, this mite low is coming up in July, according to this graph, and then it even out in September and October when these bees are getting less in brew, it's, it's not coming back down. It's still staying the same. So they're still eating on the bees there. Um, the impact from the royal mite, there's a major impact on that. All, meat, all bees can have this, but it's transferred from bee to bee by varroa. It's deformed wing virus. Not all wings with deformed wing virus have deformed wing virus. I mean, with deformed wings have deformed wing virus. Acute bee prosalis virus, black queen cell virus, Israel acute perilous virus, sackbird virus. 
I don't know what's wrong. I can't talk tonight. But anyway, these are viruses that are transmitted by the varroa mite. They don't just come in contact with another bee and get these viruses. The varroa mite is a carrier for it. Um, there's no treatment today. They don't need viruses. The only thing we do is keep our varroa levels low. Um, the varroa reduces the lifespan of the adult bee. It's an impact. They'll die quick sooner. It compromises the bee immune system. It can lead to colony collapse in late at fall and early winter. Um, I say the same thing. Okay, deformed wing virus equals lower bee immunity, which is, equals increased mite fertility and feeding. So the bees are not going to be able to stand up to them to fight them off or to groom them off. So they're going to increase. So you've got to keep that in mind. And seasonal mite growth, this is our chart again. See here the brew is going up and it's coming back down and this is not. And this is when our winter bee production population is starting August, September, right through here. As your days start getting shorter, she'll cut back on laying. Also, the bees will start filling in those cells that she was laying in as bees hatch with pollen and nectar sources so they can get through the winter. So you've got to keep that in mind on your mite growth. And the signs of roa. You have reduced body fat on your bees. You have reduced longevity. They're not living as long. They have a suppressed immune system. They have virus transmission. Um, pollen increases bees' immunity, health, and survivorship, except if the mites are high. So if you have a high mite load, the pollen is not going to help. And roa can indirectly prevent bees from detoxifying pesticide, where they would be able to, you know, detoxify it and do away with it. They've got a weakened immune system. It's, it's going to attach and hurt them. And it's closely linked to colony mortality is the varroa mites. Signs of varroa, this here is healthy brew. See how it looks. Not all, not all your captains are going to be this color. This is this year's whack. See how your brew has a lot of wet in there. And they're just, the pupas here are covered. And um, they, it looks healthy. Um, clinical signs are the you can have row on the adult bee, you can see it, you can see bro roa in the brood, the drone brood, and then you may have two down brood. You have deformed wing buyers, parasite mite syndrome, or row of mite brood syndrome. Um, can you see on this picture here, there's a mite and they're crawling around. So look between your cells for the mites. Um, mites attached between the segment, segment, segments of the bee abdomen, making them difficult to see. But look, if you look around there, you may be able to find them. Um, visual inspections are often inaccurate. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And typically you will see mites on adult bees only when the mite levels are very high. And that's what we went over from Dr. Ramsey. If the levels are high, you'll see it crawl around on this head or maybe underneath that wing there. And we used to think that that was just a, oh, well, I did. I used to think if I saw a few that wasn't, you know, a major problem, but it was. It was actually, I had a major problem right then, but I didn't realize it. Um, that's the mites in the drone brew there. Again, you can see it right here. So look at your drone brew, check them out. Drone brew looks like a 38 bullet sticking up there. Um, whereas the others are, let's see, kept, they're kept over about the same right there. That's worker brew. And drone brews, like I said, they look like a 38. That drone is more muscle, that larva is more muscle, and people will be more muscular. So it needs a little bit more room. Um, mites and worker brews, so this is chewed down brew. The bees know that there's a problem, so they have chewed the holes in that to let the um, mites out or to get them out of there, pull that pupa out and dispose of it. The pupa is starting to turn brown. Now, this is also a, could be another problem called European fowl brew. So if you go up to a hive and you see this at front, you may, I would do further investigation. <coughs> I would look to see, open it up, look, see if I had European fowl brew. Look for, or if I've got white, the bee defecation right around the top of these cells. If you have that bee, that roa mite defecation right here, then you know that you've got roa mites 
but I would look to see because this could also be a sign of European fabric. I would do a little bit more research on that high right there. Um, two bound brew. The mites, France is in the brew area, white specks or patches on the brew right there. Can you see that? But there's white specks right around them edges there. It just looks dirty right around. They won't defecate down on that pupa. They come right up underneath that calf and around that edge right there. So I would be look when you inspect your hives, look at that to see how bad by visual inspection, how bad your infestation is. Um, this is Roma mite brew syndrome here. The bees are going around checking, so you can see there there was a problem. But like I said, if you see that brown pupa, you may have varroa mites or you may have another disease, so I'd be careful. Monitoring for varroa mite, you can do samples, you can do a alcohol wash, or you can also do a powder sugar wash. Um, you see mite sign, if you want to check and see how much you got pres present, do a mite wash every month if you can. Um, you can do a bee sample by alcohol or European. And then you make your decision what you want to do based on your results. Um, you separate the mites to, in order to do this, you got to separate the mites from the adult bees and count your mites. You take, you go down into that brood chamber and you take out a half a cup, which is equal to 300 bees. Now I count exactly how many bees I have took out. I look down in there and I look to see if there's a queen. If I don't see a queen on that frame at all, and then that, because the mites are going to be in their bruise cells there, and they're, they, they're going to be on these young bees too, because they've just come out and they're feeding and they're going around and they're, um, they're doing the housekeeping duties and taking in nectar. So right in here is where I would look. And like I said, I would make sure I don't have a queen on there. So if there's a queen in there and you accidentally kill her, you're going to put you down two weeks or three while they, it takes 14 days from the day the egg was laid in order to get a queen and she's got to get out and get bread. So you may be talking about a month right there. And um, they're about 50 to 80% are hiding down in the brood. So you may not get an actual figure that, to what's going on, but it'll give you an ideal. So you take out a frame and then you got to report as mites per 100 bees. So if you pull out 300 bees, you find 12 mites, you take 12 divided by three, so that's more 4% mite count there. And then we'll, we'll go over a chart here in a second. More like, mites are more likely to be found on frames with brew. So in your honey, like I was telling you, they're not living down in there. They're not, there's no protein for them where the honey is. They're down in here where the brood and this pollen is. And they're more likely to be on the young nurse bees because they've come out with them. Um, alcohol wash is your golden standard. Alcohol has a higher percent. It's better since the mites um, sink more readily. But you can use dishwashing, Don dishwashing soap if you need to. You got to put it in there heavy. It does kill the bees. The bees will not live after this test. Um, if you can't with COVID, get alcohol, the um, car wash, the the windshield wiper fluid that is winter has alcohol in it. And I've used it quite a bit and it works well. Um, you need 70 91% alcohol or Dawn dishwashing soap. You need a jar. You need a flashing or two to put between there. Um, you need a half a cup so you measure your bees. And the mesh on that half a cup needs to be about size eight hardware cloth, which means eight holes per inch. And you need to ID the hive that you check so you know which hive you check next month. Um, you inspect your frame for your queen before shaking your bees into a flashing, which is some sort of pan from a cup down into. If you see her, take you, get you another frame or gently place her back in the hive. If you don't see her, look around and make sure that you don't have her before you drop those bees down into a flashing. And then they use a pan in this picture here, and then you drop them down into half a cup, and that's a half a cup of bees right there. And it's better to have too many than too few. We've done some where we had 290. And I've done where I've had 322. And you put the bees inside this solution with alcohol. And you swirl it around for about a minute or two. And then you pour them out through a measuring screen. And that eight inch of the 
the um, bees, you can see them dead there. You pour the bees out and your alcohol out and then you count the number of mites that's left on that screen there. So this is a double screen here. They poured the bees through and then they counted every mite. And you may have to take your phone. Some people took their phone or take a magnifying glass to make sure that's a mite, not a speck of dirt. So you start counting. And like I said, count how many mites you have and then divide it into 100. So number of mites per 100, um, divide the number of mites in the sample by the number of bees in the sample and times 100. So 300 bees divided by mite number three. The four mites, 100 bees are 3%, 3, be 1B per solution, 1% one, 1 infestation. If you're going to use a powder sugar method, it's not as good as alcohol, but you do not kill the bees. So if you accidentally have the queen in there, you're not going to kill her, but you may damage her, shaking her around. So try your best not to get your queen. Um, sugar can get underneath the mite's feet. It doesn't kill the bees. You need to shake hard for about one minute. And it um, doesn't work in high humidity or if they're in a, a good honey flow, as we will be in March. Therefore, it's too sticky for it to work good in the clump up there. And um, so that's why they have problems with powder sugar. University of Minnesota has this device. It has a your powder sugar and you have two like pint jars. See there? And then you have that wire over your jar lid to catch a, hold the bees back and shake the mites out. I monitor mites monthly during the bee season. A negative detection does not mean that mites are not present, so they could be hid down in that brood and you wouldn't see them. Um, number of bees in the sample could give you an error if you don't have enough. If bees in the sample are representative of the colony, and if they're not representative of the colony, you get a bunch of field bees or something in there and it's not representation really good, you could get a false negative right there. Um, if the Colon, uh, if the colony or colony sample are not representative of all the other colonies, your sampling method and technique, number of mites in the brew, and the amount of brew, and underestimation could lead to later issue. And like I said, that one man, he we didn't think he had any mites, and he did. He, he hit quite a few. Had he not treated by midsummer, he'd been lost his hives. Um, control two different times a year, mainly for what they're saying control. If you have problems and you've got honey box, there is, uh, there is treatment that you can use, but a lot, you've got to read on there and make sure that your treatment goes with honey on there. You can control here in April, May, and then control in August and September. Between there, you got to go by the temperature and whether you've got honey boxes on that hive. You, we can also use um, acetic acid when there's not no brew in there, and that's during this time of year that we're at now. Um, if their colony phase of dormant would brew less than 2%, you're looking at 3% dormant without brew, 3% when your population is increasing, and in June when you're in peak population, 5% and 3%. So you've got to go by what your, I've heard Tammy Horn Potter say 3% or higher, she would treat for varroa mites. And you can go after this week and check them and go back next week and they have went and robbed a weaker hive and they'll have varroa mites real heavy. So you'll have to treat. So you've got to keep an eye on your bees for that reason. Um, do it once a month. Um, you can keep your colony small. Um, and to do brew breaks in there, which will restrict the amount of brew by breaking that brew cycle, you're going to cut down on the room for grower to grow. So they won't be as much. You can confine your queen when doing this. Um, make smaller colonies out of larger colonies. Do walk away splits. Start a new colony and break that brew production up. And that way, and see, it takes about four weeks to have a laying queen, as I was saying earlier. That way, you break that brew cycle for that mite and they'll come down some. Um, another solution, keep colonies in isolated areas. However, I don't see exactly how you do that nowadays because I have my bees sitting on a reclaimed site and um, 
by car it takes me 30 or 40 minutes to get from one hive to the other and it's rough terrain and I really thought it was long distance actually in distance it wasn't even half a mile or miles so and they fly when there's not a lot to eat they'll fly up to four miles some people have told me five if there's quite a bit going on they'll eat within a mile so it's a mile as a crow flies so you've got to take that in, nice, in consideration there's so many colonies and the colonies back in the wild so I don't see how we can keep them isolated but you may be able to um, mice prefer drone larvae since they can produce more offspring and you can introduce frames of drone comb into the hive which is a green foundation and then you take it out before they hatch scratch it off put it in the freezer kill off the mites scratch it off feed it to the chickens dispose of it put it back in there you got to make sure that before that mite is between the capping when that pupa gets capped and the time that that drone is going to come out of there make sure that you pull that out and go put it in the freezer and kill them mites or you put a mite factory in there so between the capping and the 24th day you've got to take that out of that hive that's important unless you're raising drones spring bottom board is where the mites groom them all i mean they fall off the bees the bees groom them all they fall down on that spring bottom board and then they um the thought is they go through to the bottom and they can't come back up there they have a sticky board on them but they're saying now the 10 percent efficiency the screen bomb boards what we used back when we didn't really have no way of treating the mites they were there and we had to do something we just we didn't have nothing to do really so the screen bomb board is not as effective as we hope but we were doing something we were getting rid of about 10 percent of the mites this here is a heavy mine infestation something's got to be done here for treatment they'll be real red looking you can take the bottle board and smear a little like crisco on it so when they fall down there you can, they're stuck and you can go look at them and count them and see that way but that's not an accurate measurement um grow resistant stock of bees which we're working on um they have grooming hygienic behavior a row of sensitive hygienic such as the mite biters for grooming minnesota hygienic bee from the university of minnesota and the rural sensitive hygiene is coming out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, the breeding honeybees is similar to breeding other animals. So we pick from bees that are showing natural defensive mechanism to chew in the mite. I know quite a few people have talked to Dorothy Morgan at Peru. The, they had bred for a bee that when it sees a mite it attacks it and then it chews its leg or breaks its leg and then the mite falls to the bottom and it dies belly up so you know that it's dead and you can look at it with through a microscope or with a lens no breed bee is resistant to mites yet um, with their stocks that reduce mite population growth and they're thinking that the bees in the wild are naturally doing this they're not being treated that Fibro mites that are alive for several years. So this this is what they're thinking is going on. The grooming behavior is where they chew and break the legs or they bite the mite in these areas and kill it. So the bees are developing a mechanism in our country in order to take care of the mites. Um, the hygienic behavior is she's laid an egg and the bees go along on top and they smell that there's something wrong inside there because that grower might release on a different pheromone so then the bee take out the chew a hole in the cabin and they take out the pupa and they throw it outside the front of the hive so um after she has started laying so the, you can buy bees that have this hygienic behavior um, they investigate the cells they uncap the cells and some of them are doing a row of sensitive hygienic vsh and or if they don't see a uh, row of mine in there they'll recap the cell and if they do see a row of mine in there they'll remove the brood so this is an important different mechanism we have also now if you're going to do a treatment you need to follow the label on the treatment you need to see what the temperature uh, if you got honey on there the brew in the colony honey super and you need to make sure you wear personal protective equipment to make sure that you are um, 
okay when you're doing it. Um, because it also as you have to wear a respirator and goggles. Um, a chemical mask. If not, it will burn your lungs. Um, treatment is killing a bug on a bug, so you gotta be careful of your dosage. No treatment if it's no treatment is highly affected. Not one in particular has no hun honeybee wax contamination. You're gonna have a little bit of contamination. Really, no treatment is inexpensive. There's some cost to it. It takes your labor. Um, not no treatment is none of them are easy to use and has no risk to brew or be low. So you're not gonna find a perfect mite treatment as of yet, but you can keep trying. But some of them may be easier to use, some of them may be cheaper than the others. Um, you just have to look through there. Um, type of treatment is temperature for fumigants, um, efficiency, hive structure, number of bosses, your contact, your number of mites, um, amount of brew, and as much as your trees, the rubber levels are not out of control and there's less damage to the bees. The factors that affect the efficiency of your treatment. Um, there's different types of treatment. There's an organic acid, such as acetic acid, formic acid, Afgar, essential oils such as Apgard, and synthetic treatments such as Apovar, Apostan, and Checkmite. And Apostan, I was talking to a man. I was Apostan is not as effective as it once was. The mites are developing a little bit more resistant to it. It was the first treatment that we had available, or that I knew of, was Apostan. That was the first treatment we had. So the mites over the past 20 or 30, 20 years are developing resistance to some of these treatments. So you've got to be careful of what you use. The salesman seemed to think, um, the Apostan salesman seemed to think that there might be some mites in some areas where there's not a lot of bees, that have not built resistance. So if I use any of them, I would check to make sure how, how they're working and what's going on. Um, ply treatment, you need to read and follow your direction label, following ply as directed. And if it says to leave it in there so many weeks and go back and remove it, go back and remove it. Because if not, you're building up a resistance to it. I know beekeepers that put apostan in in the fall and then take some strips out to the spring. Um, you gotta wear the protect the gear, you gotta rotate your chemicals to avoid mite resistant and do a beeless run to make sure you know what you're doing. And it said to watch, I was reading this and it said to watch YouTube video from a trusted source. I would use um, video from uh, the Honey Bee Coalition, which I'm gonna give you here at the end. Um, Rural sensitive hygiene is a specialized form of hygienic behavior. These are bees that are coming out of the USDA in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Hawaii, called Haiku. Bees are more sensitive to the olfactor cue from the rural infested brew. So they're, they're smelling that pheromone. And then, like I said, they're doing an uncapping and a recapping. Apovar is one of the treatments. It kills mites in the brew. It works by common contact, no temperature restrictions on it. And it's one strip per five frames and you leave it in there 42, 56 days. The advantage is that it's up to 95% efficiency right now. This advantage is breakdown can contaminate wax. Does not work immediately. It's still in that hive and it has a higher chance of mites building up resistance to it. Isolic acid, which is what a lot of people should be using right now for treating for mites, is an organic acid. It does not kill the mites in the brew. So if you go to use it in June and July when you've got a ton of brew in there, it's not going to kill them in the brew. It's going to kill them that is on the bee. It works by contact. There's no temperature resistance to it. You can drip it. Our, we use vapor, vaporization here, and some, pe some people are missing it. Is 82 to 99 percent efficiency if there's no brew. It can be combined with a brew break where you pull out the queen or you broke up the um, laying going on in that hive because you took out a frame of brew and the queen and started a new hive or something and you have a low chance of resistance to this and it's inexpensive. The disadvantage to too high of dose or repeated application of drip can damage your honeybees. So this is something you got to think about when you use acetic acid. Um, Honeybee Health Coalition, that is a wonderful resource. I can't say enough good about them. 
pull up them if you've got a question about what you're doing and it will show you how to do it and walk you through it step by step and their concern was safety and mic threshold and they have several really good videos that show you exactly what to do and how to do it so this honeybee health collision if you haven't checked them out i would and i would be studying their videos um you got to know your enemy if you don't know this rubber mite, and like I said, their biology is changing, the thought, the research is changing on it, you can't combat what you don't know. So study and look at what's going on with them. And this here is my name and my cell phone and my email address is not on here, but it's laura.rogers at kysu.edu. If you ever need to get a hold of me, just give me a call. Um, if for some reason I don't answer back, call me back. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I mean, I'm here to help you. And I'm six generation, I'm five generations at least, a honeybee. So I know quite a bit what's going on in the hive. Lived through it, made mistakes, rookie mistakes. And then after I learned, the more I learned, the more I realized I don't know. Because it's just like the row of mine, it keeps changing. You think you have it right now, and then it, a few years research may show us something totally different. These fellas here are serious and they're rough on our bees. And to me, the, the beekeeper is the number one enemy. Second enemy, small high beetle. Third enemy, varroa mites. So we've got to make, I'm working on a 10 most wanted list. And varroa mites and small high beetles are at the top right behind me. I made more mistakes. Um, example of a mistake is, my dad and them always believed if you leave them drones in the hive, they're pulling down on your honey. So growing up, that's all I ever heard. Cut them drones out of there. Cut them drones out of there. They're eating up all the honey. And so we would go down there and cut out all the drones. The drones are the male bees. So the bees would not be doing well. And I couldn't understand. I'd go, I don't understand what in the world is wrong with these bees. I've done everything I know. So one day I went down there and they just act plumb depressed. And I got thinking, I thought, if I lived in a house with 70,000 women and there was no drones or males in there with a different voice, I'd be depressed too. And I come back to the house, my husband said, what in the world is wrong with you? I said, I just realized we've been making a bad mistake. We're cutting out all that drone brood. And when we're doing that, we're, we're doing something to make them bees depressed. And then I told him, I said, if I lived in there with all that many women, I'd be depressed also. I knew you need that male sound and you know just different anyway he said well don't cut them out again well i didn't cut them out no more and then bees started doing better and now research has showed that the all bees naturally flap their wings move ventilation here i am with my knife cutting out part of their ventilation air force that they're needing to keep the drone uh, keep the um brew at the temperature they need it by that airflow and then they need airflow up in the top to bring that moisture level down on that honey and here I am going through there with a knife. So I cut out part of the workforce and they were getting depressed about it. And then they're in there for morale too. They just naturally, their sound is different than the other bees sound and it just all comes together and it changes up the spirit of the hive. So I'm a firm believer, don't cut out all them drones. Um, I don't no more, but I had to learn through experience. And that's why I'm saying I made mistakes so if you make a mistake, don't feel bad. I just learn from it and go on and laugh about it because I learned something I won't ever do again. Does anybody have any questions or anything? And y'all can unmute yourself if you have questions. I had about a, did you say that there was no treatment for like the the viruses that varroa mites pass to bees, like the, the farm not, not right now. There's not a treatment. But if you keep that varroa mite level low, mm -hmm. that will, you know, cut down on it. Yeah. And so I was even wondering, see, on the varroa mite, let's see, the deformed wing virus, I was taught that they were in there chewing on that pupa as it's growing. So his wings were K-shaped and they deformed because of that varroa mites in there. I've been wanting to do a little bit more research now to see if it's from the 
I know it's a virus that they're injecting, but could part of it be where the bees, you know, immunity is down, mm -hmm. the protein buildup and stuff. So I just want to check on that and do a little bit more research on that. But they'll have, if you got a bad um, growing mite problem, they'll have a cave wing too. It's, it looks just like a cave when you see it. Hmm. It won't lay flat, it'll be deformed. So when I open up my hives, I'm looking at the wings. I'm looking at how they move around. I'm listening to the sound that they make. You know if they make a depressed sound, you'll hear it. And if they make a good sound, you'll hear it. So I'm looking at all of that. If right now, this time of year, there shouldn't be no pollen going in there. So there's not a lot of pollen in the environment for them. But if I see pollen going in that hive, it tells me that there's brew in there. There's some sort of brew in that hive. So I'm looking for pollen. Now, if you feed chickens or ducks or something like that, or your cattle, feed them early in the morning or late in the evening, because they'll get the pollen out of the feeder and pack it back to the hive. And if they steam, I had a man to call me. He said, Laura, I don't know why, but they keep picking on this one duck. So that one duck must have walked up there and stuck one of them or done something because he got stung. And then that released that banana pheromone smell, and it drawn more bees to him. So that's how come he was being stung that I could figure all the time. He just kept aggravating them and then they released that smell on him. Anyway, the man was going to start feeding the ducks and stuff before daylight or after dark. But you got to be aware of that. And so that's why I think about that. Anybody else have a question for Laura? Not seeing any in the chat. Well, we thank you for joining us again, Laura. We really appreciate it. Anytime y'all need me, just let me know. And like I said, I enjoy bees. And if I can help you, let me know. <laughs>